Welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of one of the largest and oldest wrestling families on the planet. The Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. Through 93 years and four generations. The Stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name. You will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Please welcome the creator of the popular 605 podcast and the president of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, your co-host, the great Ryan Last. Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I'm the great Ryan Last. It is my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee stud goes down that road of wrestling history, sharing his personal tales and anecdotes with all of us. And before we get going, I want to real quick right here at the top of the show, thank all the listeners for their tremendous interest in the one-hour studcast, of course, that you're listening to right now, but also all the patrons who have been supporting the Super Studcast number 13. The two-part series on the Knoxville Wrestling War of 1979 is still breaking records. And the new Super Studcast number 14 with Dr. D, David Schultz, is heading in that same direction, it looks like. These are three-plus hours each month deep dives into classic wrestling history, and we're hearing from a lot of the listeners who are finding this to be a spellbinding experience for all true wrestling history fans. But without any further ado, we'll talk more about the Super later on in the show. The man of the hour, the host of the Studcast, the Tennessee stud himself, Ron Fuller. Ron, how are you today? I am doing great, my man. Doing really, really good. Really happy to be back here. Uh, like, like usual, horses all saddled up and... Uh, I can't wait to get in that saddle and get the rolling on it. Uh, we're going to be, uh, we're in Knoxville, and uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time for quite a while here talking about uh, what a great thing is about to happen for wrestling in that eastern side of Tennessee and in, in that Knoxville area. Really looking forward to it. Of course, in the previous couple of episodes, you went into Knoxville, you met with John Kazana, you bought the town and you decided you were going to turn it into a territory. That's where we left it. It's the fall of 1974. Where are we going today, Ron? Well, we're going to, we're going to rename the television wrestling show. uh, And and like you said, the company that I've recently purchased, uh, we're going to take over control of the present company. We're going to incorporate under the name of Southeastern Championship Wrestling. We're going to decide whether to work as a baby face or a heel which I've never been a heel in my years of wrestling. Uh, we're going to start building a new persona for me. Uh, we're going to come up with my new name that's going to follow me the rest of my career. So we've got a pretty big program for today. We're going to go a lot of different directions. And uh, I'm just going to jump right into it, my man. Uh, you know, as you said, I've just paid the down payment for Knoxville. Uh, I wrestled my first match ever there on October 11th, 1974 against Dennis Hall, a pretty darn good wrestler and a personal friend of mine and a real close friend with Les Thatcher, who's going to be getting more and more involved with Southeastern wrestling here in the early part of it. Uh, It's still John Kazana's city uh, until Friday, October 25th. And uh, on that Friday night, October 25th, I'm going to get the proceeds and I'm going to actually own officially Knoxville. Uh, And when the television uh, comes on for the next day, on the day after that Friday, on Saturday, uh, we're going to change the name of the program. It's no longer going to be John Kazana's Wide World of Wrestling, but the program's name will be Southeastern Championship Wrestling. Uh, and that's a huge, huge uh, thing for fans. Uh, they're not expecting this, obviously. They have no idea why, 
Uh, I don't talk to John Kazana and, and, and tell him, you know, John, don't tell anybody this or don't tell anybody that. I kind of leave it up to John how he wants to handle the fact that he no longer owns Knoxville. And he uh, he does a pretty good job of it. I tell him that I'd rather people not know that I'm the promoter. Uh, and he understands that. Uh, so significant changes are going to be soon coming to the wrestling program for sure. I'm very unhappy about a lot of things I see with the wrestling program. And I want to start working on that first because I think that's the most critical part of the equation here is what you do on television. And uh, from this point forward, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and on the eastern side of Tennessee, there will be no official owner or figurehead for that company. Uh, and that's pretty unusual, never been done. I got to ask you a few questions here, Ron. One, how did you come up with the name Southeastern Championship Wrestling? Well, we're in the Southeast. Uh, there's a lot of wrestling territories around around me at this point. I'm looking there. You've got the Tennessee Territory. You've got uh, east of me, west of me, you have Nashville. East of me, you have Charlotte and, uh, and Crockett's Territory. Uh, to the south, uh, Chattanooga is owned by Harry Thornton and Nick Goulis and Roy Welch. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different territories close in the area. Above me there is Sheik up in the Ohio area. So I got to, you know, come up with a name that, that fits kind of where I'm located. And uh, just Southeastern just kind of came to me. Uh, it says South, obviously, uh, you've got that word Eastern thrown in there. You're not talking about Texas, obviously. So I thought it fit pretty well. And, and I don't know that the name of your company is really all that important. I think there's a lot more important things that go into it than what the name was. So I just came up with the name. I said, here's what we're going to run with. And, uh, and we took off. So you know, that now nobody's going to know. And you had another question. Did you have another question, Brian? Yeah, real quick. Uh, Friday, October 25th, you mentioned that starting this date, the proceeds all went to you. Everything was going to you. How did it actually work on that night when you're there on the 25th? At the end of the night, did someone come up to you and give you the gate? How does it work that first night when you take over? Well, there's a gentleman there that's been uh, handling the box office for John Kazana, for many, many years. Uh, I don't know anyone in Knoxville. And I asked John, I say, John, when I take over here, who would you recommend? I need somebody to handle the box office because I'm going to be obviously in the dressing room and I can't see it or do anything in that. And he turns me on to this guy. And the guy, I really like him. He, he's been there and doing it for a long time. Uh, if I'm going to make some changes, I don't want to make that change right off. I need somebody then there that's trustworthy and somebody knows what he's doing. So I tell him, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring to me uh, by the semifinal match, the second to the last match, uh, the gate receipts and, uh, and bring me a pad. And then I make my first payoff in history. Uh, and that's an experience for me as well. I think it probably took me quite a while that first night because I'd, I'd never made a payoff before. And I had to decide, you know, who should get what. And uh, that's a little bit difficult because uh, I don't know all the talent even on that card. Uh, some of these guys, a couple of them on there, I'd never met in my life. So it was difficult for me to make those decisions. And I had the guy that was going to just run the money up there and it, when I was paying in cash back in those days. Uh, he was keeping a record of what each person was made, each guy made, and then we're going to 1099 them at the end of the year. They had all that process already put together, thank goodness. And basically all I needed him to do, bring me the gate, uh, bring me a notepad, uh, take back the figures, bring me the cash, and I will pay. Uh, I thought it was important, since I was a new owner and a young guy, that I pay myself rather than have somebody else do it and i pretty much kept this this uh operation standard uh pretty much the entire time i was in knoxville actually and didn't change much until pensacola and at that point we were in a lot bigger cities and and spread out more and having to deal with more different people than uh just this one guy basically in the knoxville box office but uh yeah, the guy was a great guy. He did a super job for me. He was there 
for all of it from the beginning to the time I left in 1979. And that's kind of why when we talked about uh, in uh, Super Stud Cast number 13, the wrestling war, about these wrestlers saying, well, these houses aren't being paid properly. Uh, that's why I just couldn't find any truth to that because this guy had been there from the beginning. He's a very honest fellow, and I really trusted him. And, uh, you know, and I'd done my homework. I probably tested him on occasion just to see if if the house was correct and uh, never had any problems with it. So I was very comfortable with this guy. Ron, I understand why you wouldn't want it known that you were the promoter, but why not have a figurehead? I remember Bill Watts had Charlie Lay as the figurehead president of Mid-South Wrestling, even though he was in Tampa. Why not have a figurehead or someone else? Well, I would have probably had to have somebody in mind. Uh, I couldn't have used my dad as an example because I knew I was going to be on those cards. And, you know, you can't you can't have a, a father owning the company, uh, a la uh, Nick Goulas and George. You know, I mean, I didn't want to get into that type of situation to where people go, well, uh, you know, Ron's on the main event because his dad owns the company. Uh, you know, he would have been a good candidate. He, he would have been able to talk well on television. He'd been a perfect choice for it. But I just felt like that that the people didn't really care about who owned the company. And, uh, you know, I, I just went with it and it worked for me. It was really good. Well, Ron, that was something that Tennessee wrestling was known for, was you always knew who the promoter was. You always knew it was Nick Goulas and Roy Welch or whoever it may be, right? Yeah, that's correct. You know, and uh, and they, they had already always done business that way. And I think it was it had never been done in Tennessee wrestling history, what I was about to do. And uh, all across the state, each television show highlighted the owner and the promoter. I mean, they didn't just say he is the owner. They had him on the show every week. And they have it. sometimes they would bring him in and use him if there was going to work an angle and they wanted to change the card or whatever it may be, they would say, Hey, uh, come on in here. And, uh, you know, in John Kazana's case there in Knoxville, they'd say, John, come in here. Uh, we want to change. They're talking about changing this card. Can we do that? Uh, so, you know, as an example in Tennessee, in the state of Tennessee, uh, you had wrestling in Chattanooga. There was a local promoter there named Harry Thornton who actually owned a small piece of Chattanooga. And, but the real owners there were Nick Goulas and Roy Welch. And uh, in Memphis, uh, they were recognized as the owners. They didn't have any problem, Nick and Roy, about saying, hey, they, these are the promoters of Memphis wrestling. Uh, Nashville, same guy, same two guys. Uh, and John Kazana was the guy in Knoxville. I didn't think it was going to be uh, a real problem. Uh, and my ownership is going to remain unknown there until 1979 when the Knoxville Five, the five wrestlers that decided they want to try to take the territory, uh, they exposed me pretty quickly in, in the war uh, as the owner of Southeastern Wrestling from the beginning. And, uh, and you know, and they started right at the beginning of the Knoxville War. And, you know, like I just said, I've always believed it's really not important to the fans who the promoter or the owner is. It, but it's more uh, of effectively that person that that runs it. But but it's more important about how they run the business, not who owns it, but how do they run this business? What kind of talent are they going to have? What kind of bookers are they going to have? What kind of matches are going to book? Uh, how are they going to watch these matches and make sure that they're getting everything that the fans are getting everything they buy a ticket for? Uh, I always felt like the fans didn't buy tickets to see the promoter. They bought them to see the product. And uh, I'd never had an ego. I think a lot of promoters uh, that want to say I'm the promoter here, uh, Nick and Roy, especially Nick, had an ego problem. And he wanted to be recognized as the promoter. Roy had been a wrestler there, and he didn't really want to be recognized as a promoter. But after he quit wrestling, I guess he felt comfortable with saying, hey, yeah, I'm the promoter. So, you know. I, I didn't have this ego problem, so I didn't care that they mentioned me. And, and then I, I realized if if I'm thinking maybe I might need to be a heel here, I certainly don't want to, to know I'm the promoter because then, the, you know, they're going to blame me for things that happen on the program and happen on the, on the television show and at the matches themselves. And if they don't like what I'm doing, they'll quit coming, and, uh, and that would have a, 
a great bearing on whether I'm going to have success at Southeastern Wrestling or whether I'm going to fail simply because I say, hey, I'm the promoter. Ron, I don't recall. Was John Kazana doing live television? Live. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to get to that in the program today. Yeah, you know, another fact, uh, that's another fact of what's going on. Uh, television shows across the state of Tennessee and in a lot of territories in the world at this time frame uh, were live uh, because a lot of these stations, they were just getting the ability to tape programs. And they were using those big old wide two-inch tapes that came in a box that weighed about 60 pounds. And it, you know, there weren't many two inch machines in all the television studios at that point. So if your show, John Kazana shows at 630 on Saturday night, that means that they're shooting that thing live. It's going out on the air live. Uh, very few territories were capable of doing what Tampa was doing. Tampa was ahead of most places, and they were taping that show at the Sportatorium on Wednesdays, and then they were going back, running dubs of that tape off on a second machine, and then inserting the interviews and sending that out to all the markets in the state. Uh, so, you know, stations, few of them didn't have the ability to record. This made it extremely difficult to run the Tennessee Territory uh, because uh, you had these live TVs everywhere. You had live TVs in Alabama. Uh, this is just the Tennessee Territory. You had live TVs in Alabama, in Arkansas, in Missouri, in Kentucky, in West Virginia, in Mississippi, in Louisiana, and in Tennessee. Uh, just imagine how many wrestlers was necessary just to fill TVs on a Saturday. Uh, you had television programs being done on Saturdays in 19 different cities in eight states out of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, wrestlers after those TVs then made their way to a nearby regular Saturday night promotion. So, gosh, it was like... The, the Knoxville TV was one of those 19 around the southern United States, and all the talent for all these shows, these television programs, came out of Nashville, the home of the Tennessee Territory. It was a logistics nightmare. I mean, it was, and it was very ineffective because their talent was so divided by the sheer number of TVs that they were having to run on Saturdays uh, that uh, they, the quality of the talent, the quality of the program was just not what it could have been. Uh, if you can imagine you having to send different guys to all these television stations, if they had have taken that great core of talent that they had and made one tremendous program and then copied that tape and, and uh, bicycled it, is what we used to use the term, bicycle that tape around to all those markets, think of how much better those wrestling programs would have been. So, that uh, quality, they had a lack of quality talent in the Tennessee Territory, and that was what I thought. That was my personal opinion. I just looked at the guys that I saw and the names that I saw, and I, I said, geez, man, they really don't have the talent that a Florida has, and they've got so much more area of the country to cover with that talent. So they, had a, it was, they were having limited success with a lot of their shows, and the potential – was just not going to be there at the box office because of the way they were running their business. To me, it was an extremely bad business model. And I knew that from my Florida experience, I knew that knew exactly what needed to be done to change it. And uh, that was one of my goals. I could not do anything at this point. I'm on a UHF channel with a small signal that doesn't have uh, two-inch tapes there. They have no ability to record the show. I'm stuck with this live program until I can make a move to a bigger and a better television station. Ron, how did you incorporate Southeastern, and when did you incorporate Southeastern? I incorporated it really quickly. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I know I'm going to take over, and uh, one of the first things you need to do is take care of business. And uh, obviously, you need to incorporate uh, or an LLC or whatever, some type of some protection as an owner of a company that you're going to get and have. Uh, so I incorporated on Thursday, October 17th, 1974. Uh, I'm just 26 years old, and, and I got to tell you, the event of sitting down and 
going through all the stuff that needs to be done with a team of lawyers, it made me extremely nervous because uh, I, I realize I'm embarking on a journey that it has absolutely no guarantee of success. Uh, I owed more money over the next five years than I even wanted to think about. Uh, and then I go to the first crowd on that first night on Friday, October 11th, when I work against Dennis Hall, and, and I see this crowd in Chilhowee Park in Knoxville, and, and it's small. I, it was much less than I was anticipating seeing my first time there. And that left me even more in doubt about whether I was going to be successful or not. But, you know, I'd become a pretty darn good competitor in the ring. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just started automatically just challenging myself on a daily basis to, to make a success out of this venture, that I'm not going to fail here and I'm going to work extremely hard. And that's just where I put my head and I tried to keep it there as, well, as long as I could. Ron, did you have anyone at all that you can go to for advice during this period of time? Well, obviously, I can call Eddie if I really want to talk to someone. Uh, I can call my dad. Uh, you know, he's going to give me some decent advice. Uh, I, do, I wouldn't probably have called Roy. But, uh, you know, and then I had other friends in the business. Les Thatcher is a great friend of mine at this point. And Les Thatcher's whole emphasis when he and I get together and talk is about the television show. He wants to be a commentator. That's where Les wants to go in the future. And that's exactly what I need. And I realize and not just if I could get a program and have Les as my head guy and my commentator and then pick up all the ideas he has about doing a different type of wrestling program. All that's going to come to pass. But, uh, you know, I'm at this point to where I'm kind of stuck with what I got and I've just got to make the I got to make the best of it. Ron, you mentioned several of the decisions you've had to make since you purchased Knoxville or were about to purchase Knoxville. What other decisions did you have to make? Well, you know, the next step we're going to talk about is uh, is probably one of the most critical decisions I would ever make, period. Uh, and it would be, it would have a greater impact on my future in the sport than I ever imagined. Uh, I'd been wrestling now for four years and I'd never been anything but a baby face in, in my entire career. Uh, it worked well for me because my father had been a baby face and built the name that my brother and I could ride on in our early years when we started in Georgia. And up to this point, um, my size at six, nine, I'm about 240 pounds at this point, And I'm, I'm going to get bigger, uh, at that, that size, it did not adversely affect my ability to draw money, even though I was substantially larger than most opponents, uh, but I had only worked two territories so far. I'd only worked in Georgia and Florida. Now, luckily, they had both been filled with, with big heels uh, and guys that really knew how to work. Uh, so I, my size and my height had not affected my ability to be a babyface there. Uh, but there was a dramatic difference. But there is a huge difference between being a heel and being a baby face. So. Uh, heels lead the match for one thing. It's up to the heel to call the match. Uh, you know, I'd never led an entire match. Uh, and I, the only time I had led matches was if I was working against another baby face that was less experienced than I was, somebody had to control things. And it gave me a little opportunity in Florida because I had a lot of baby face matches. They like to book wrestling matches as what I call them in which you just went out there and basically wrestled during the entire match. And I had the opportunity to do a little leading in some of those matches, but I had never had the opportunity to lead as a heel. And, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a big difference. Uh, I'd never, I'd never led an entire match and, uh, except on the say few occasions like that and heels call high spots and they control the heat during the match. Uh, they decide to when to get the heat and they decide when the comeback is going to come. They, they, they handle everything and, and they have much more important role in the quality of a match than a baby face does. Uh, healing is a skill that takes time to develop. And, and I didn't have any time to learn those heel skills. 
Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, I maybe need to be healed here because I'm pretty big and a lot of these guys are smaller. Uh, so I had to take a good look at the talent in the Tennessee Territory before making that final decision. And uh, several factors are going to come into play before I can really make that decision and, and get the right thing done. We will return with more of the Studcast in just a moment. But first, a word about the latest Super Studcast, Super Studcast 14 with Dr. D, David Schultz. Fans around the world are crazy about the new Super Studcast number 14 with Dr. D. David Schultz. Part one of this Super Studcast is being highly acclaimed as one of the most exciting and hilarious of the now 14 available at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. This Super Studcast has it all. From the slap heard around the world of John Stossel to Dr. D's extremely dangerous and jaw-dropping bounty hunter life after wrestling. This one is a must hear for wrestling fans worldwide. The rest of the story, part two of Super Number 14, will be released on Tuesday, February 26th, completing the three hour eye opening experience by giving fans the opportunity to ask their final questions about the Knoxville Wrestling War of 1979 at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Only $2.99 for three plus hours of chilling wrestling history. Saddle up for a ride. A ride like no other with one of the most dangerous wrestlers of all time and get the final word on one of the most destructive wrestling wars ever. There you hear it, Super Studcast number 14 with Dr. D, David Schultz, available at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast, only $2.99 for three plus hours of classic wrestling content a month. What better deal than that? We'll have more news in a little bit at the end of the show about the Super Stud cast and the rest of the story. But, Ron, let's return now to what you were just previously talking about before the break. Your decision about whether to be a babyface or a heel in your new company. Yeah, and it, it's a major decision. I mean, it, it, it's going to be a factor that will have a great bearing on whether I'm going to be successful or not. So, you know, I, I have about six things here that I think are important in the, for me in making this decision. And let's just call this first one the first factor. Uh, I was one of the biggest guys in the business in terms of height. There weren't a lot of guys wrestling that were taller than 6'9 at this point. And I was still growing in size because I was really only in my mid-20s. So I'm going to get bigger, and and I'm not going to grow much more in height, that's for sure. But I'm going to grow by considerable amount in, in size. I'm going to get a lot bigger from working out. Uh, and, and it's really hard to be a baby face when you're working with a wrestler that's much smaller than you. Uh, it's much easier to be a heel against a guy his, who is much smaller. Uh, fans want to cheer for the underdog anyway, and they almost always – uh, the underdog is the smaller of the two competitors. Uh, obviously, a big guy beating up a much smaller guy is automatically going to give him some heat. It's going to make him the heel. And, uh, and, and you're going to get a lot of natural heat. Just the fact that you're big, you're wrestling a guy that's uh, close to 8, 10 inches shorter than you, much smaller. Anything you do to him, <laughs> you're, especially if it's a heel move, it, it, fans are just going to hate you quick like. Uh, so in the first two weeks I wrestled in Knoxville, I realized that many of the wrestlers in that territory were much smaller than I was, uh, unlike the Georgia and Florida territories. This size factor alone definitely pushed me toward becoming a heel. When did you get your first itch to be a heel? Well, I guess I thought about it a little bit uh, even before I came to to Knoxville. And, you know, I, I considered, you know, that I might make more money as a heel than a baby face. Uh, but I really didn't seriously contemplate it until I got here. Uh, and, you know, it kind of leads me to, to the second factor. Uh, you know, I'm going to receive uh, talent for much of every, most of every card is going to come from the Nashville office, and uh, and that's the home of the Tennessee Territory. I'm going to pay a 10% booking fee for those wrestlers, as John Kazana had done for all the years he was the promoter there. Uh, Kazana had a few good wrestlers, 
that were not working out of the Nashville office, and they were on most of his cards. And they were guys that lived in the Tri-City area up there where uh, Ron Wright and Don Wright lived. Uh, there were workers up in that area that couldn't work on the, out of the regular Nashville office, maybe weren't big enough, maybe weren't good enough, uh, just couldn't get on in Nashville. But they were coming down and helping him on some of his cards. Uh, but I looked around at the group that were, that were not coming out of Nashville that were on, those, on my cards, and there were two of them that really stood out for me, and that was Ron and Don Wright. Uh, they'd been on most Knoxville cards for years, and they'd went back and forth from heels one week to baby faces the next. It just depended on who, because Anna wanted to book them with. If they're booked against heels, they're going out there in the ring. Crowd's going to cheer for them. If they're booked against baby faces, the crowd's going to boo them. Uh, they had a strange relationship in that particular market, but it was because of the time that they had spent there getting themselves over. And they were good workers. Uh, so, I, you know, then the difference between Ron and Don was Ron was a Don was smaller than his brother, Ron. He was not quite as good a worker and he wasn't quite the talker that Ron was. Don always kind of sat back, uh, you know, and, you know, when I'm considering all these things about Ron Wright, I vividly remember Ron Wright from the two weeks of of the steady chisel sharpening in the Florida dressing rooms back in 1971, as I described in the earlier stud cast, uh, Ron is kind of component about him. He's got the, he's got that factor, man. He's got a little bit of that, uh, you know, the, that's something that this, that this makes you, makes you draw money. And, uh, Ron had it, uh, so, I know they're both going to be available to me and, uh, and I could have them every Friday. Uh, I didn't have, I had no guarantee who I would going to get each Friday from Nashville. And a lot of times they're going to get substituted. I'm going to find that out in the first couple of weeks that this is not going to work like it's been set up for years and years, uh, with John Kazana, because I'm not going to allow them not to send me the people they tell me they're going to. So I, I decide quickly that the Wright brothers, especially Ron, is going to be the guy that's perfect for my first big single opponent to work an angle and a program with, and that we are probably a, the best combination, he and I, to quickly jump the size of the crowds. Uh, he could work either way. He could work as a baby or a, fee, or a heel. Uh, but my size, again, pushed me toward the heel against uh, against this big time Knoxville favorite of Ron Wright because it just made sense. I'm bigger than he is and it's just seems more natural that being my size I should be a heel. After you purchased the company Ron, how long did you use the Nashville booking office talent after that? A very short period of time. I couldn't get out of that fast enough basically i realized within the first two shows and the first two shows the 11th and the 18th of october i did not own the territory they weren't mine uh, but i saw the substitutions in those first two nights and you know you weren't substituting better talent for worse talent and you were going very much the opposite direction the big boys didn't show up and you got guys that just were really horrible and now they're in main event matches that type of stuff will kill you right off the bat and i realized that that didn't happen in florida there were no substitutes in florida it did not happen in georgia there were no substitutes on the cards in georgia unless somebody got hurt the night before and there was no way to get around it but it seemed prevalent uh, in the tennessee territory that you're not going to get all those guys that you want and uh, you can't do business that way. It's just going to destroy you before you ever get off the ground. How's that conversation handled, though, when you decide to pull out of the agreement? Well, it, very delicately, to be honest with you. I mean, I had I, I didn't want to discuss it with Nick because I had no relationship with Nick. Uh, this is all going to go back to my grandfather who built that territory from the very beginning, who has the say. Nick doesn't have the say there anyway. Roy does. And I went and talked to Roy and told him my situation and, you know, what's happening and what I see and that I cannot build a town that I'm paying that kind of money for 
unless I get the guys that's booked to show up there every time they're supposed to. And a lot of times when they send these guys to you on a Friday night, they're going to stay over and be there for your television on Saturday. So if they take a main eventer and he doesn't show up on Friday, they're not going to send him over on Saturday to do your TV for you. So that means you've not only lost your main eventer for Friday night, you've lost a key element to your wrestling show that's going to try to draw your money for the next Friday night. It's a destructive fact that uh, the substitutions will kill your wrestling business. And I'm just trying to start this business. I sure got to get that out of the way early on. And I, I, I managed to get this done probably within the first three weeks that I owned the company. Uh, they realized that I'm not going to take their talent anymore. How did Roy react to that? Roy didn't have that much a problem with it because I think because I'm his grandson, uh, because he knows how much money I've obligated myself to pay for this. And he, you know, he just, I guess we're family. And, and he, you know, he said, uh, kid, uh, I think he put it in terms of, you know, uh, it's your territory. Uh, <laughs> you do what you think is best. And uh, that's what I wanted to do. Nick hated it. Nick despised me. Uh, and the word got out to me that Nick just thinks you're horrible and that you've, you've taken that town and you're not, you're not, uh, you're not committed to the Tennessee territory the way that Kazana always was. And that just had to change. Uh, and if they'd run their business differently and they'd sent me the guys that were supposed to, there'd never been a problem with that to begin with. That would not have been a factor. And, uh, speaking of the factor, let me go back and talk just a second about the heel and the baby face. My third factor has to do, it's 1974. And, and if people, if they think back, those that have been around long enough to, to be through this era, to have seen this time frame, hairstyles were different. They were long. They were, hair was in back in those days, and the long, shaggy hair was the thing. And when I started wrestling in 1970, I grew a mustache, to, and I kept my hair longer. Uh, all the different, all those years from 1970 to 74, I had a mustache until 73. I shaved my mustache off because it made me look more baby face without it. And then I was starting to work in St. Louis and I wanted to get over as a baby face. So I felt it would help me if I shaved my mustache. Uh, now I'm thinking about being a heel. I'm really getting pushed into being a heel simply because of my size. And so I decide that if I'm going to be a heel, that mustache has got to come back. And uh, so I started growing one right away. Uh, within two weeks, my first two shows in Knoxville, I decide I want to be a heel. I'm going to have to be a heel to make it to make this work. So this time uh, I decide grow a mustache, but this time I decide it's got to be a little more sinister than the little small mustache I had before. So I grew the first Fu Manchu mustache I ever had. Only only Fu Manchu mustache I ever had, actually. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I found out what amazing thing facial hair can do for your appearance, especially as a heel. Once that Fu Manchu starts coming in, uh, you don't have to say, is he a baby face or a heel? People just look at you and they go, wow, that guy's a no good son of a gun, man. He, look at him. He looks, he looks mean, you know? So it was perfect. Uh, about the third week, I, I'm growing that Fu Manchu. I'm beginning to feel like a heel. When I look in the mirror every morning, I'm like, well, yeah, you know? Uh, I knew I was headed in the right direction. Just taking a look at that Fu Manchu, hair's all long. You know, I'm seeing that that I'm beginning to get together what I'm going to need to become a good heel. Ron, before we move on to the next factor, I want to ask you, when you broke in and you had the longer hair and the mustache, did any of the veterans, did any of the older wrestlers give you any grief for that? No. You know, because back in those days, it was the hippie time anyway, basically, you know, pretty much into that era, just beyond it. And, you know, everybody's hair was longer. So, you know, I, I didn't get to extreme. I didn't get my hair down around my shoulders or anything like that. Uh, and I kept my mustache fairly trimmed. And then, you know, it didn't it didn't look like a heel mustache. That was for sure. And so, no, nobody really came to me and said, hey, look, you need to change this. You need to change that. Uh, so, 
you know, I didn't really have a problem with it. Uh, guys, guys really treated me great uh, when I was young and I got f- first started. I, maybe because of my family name and uh, and the family's reputation might have had something to do with it. But no, nobody nobody thought that. Hey, look, you 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 look like a heel here. You know, nobody ever said anything like that to me. Ron, what's the next factor? Well, the the fourth thing, I I, I needed something else. Uh, I, I couldn't figure out, uh, you know, and I'm having a difficult time figuring out just exactly what am I missing here. I didn't want to miss anything. I just wanted to make this thing happen. Uh, so one day I, I start thinking about Bobby Shane, uh, you know, and when Bobby Shane comes to mind, I think about the gimmick that he had with his wife as his valet. And I, I, he was the first one that I ever saw do that. And I know that I don't believe anybody ever did it in Florida before Bobby Chain came to Florida. And I know he got over great in Florida. So, and I don't think anybody at this point had ever done anything with their wife or with a woman associated with them in the state of Tennessee either. So I'm going to do something different. I'm trying to find something different. So I decided to use my wife in a similar fashion as what Bobby Shane used his wife, Uh, not to be a valet, not to go to the ring with me, uh, to be there at ringside, uh, to maybe get involved in a match or anything like that, just as a secretary. I wanted to call her a secretary, not even say this is my wife, but this is my secretary. And I would have her follow me out each week at TV to take notes about the talent on the show. That's basically what she would do. And I'd talk very loudly and uh, people could hear me and they'd they'd hear what I wanted her to do. And I would say, make a note about uh, Ron Wright. The guy doesn't know anything about a leg dive. We would just, I would give, talk in wrestling terms because I wanted to make my show more wrestling oriented. Uh, so, and another thing I started, decided to do that was different is, is that I, I refused from the very first day to wrestle on TV. And I bragged that the reason for that was that, that I was such a star that since the TV audience got in free, that no one was worthy of seeing my skills that did not buy a ticket for it. And so, you know, it was kind of a nasty thing to do. And I don't think anybody had ever done that before in Knoxville. Uh, so, I had them, what I had them do is leave two front row seats available in the studio. And then I would come out and bring my secretary with me. And we would sit in those front row seats and uh, we would come out only for my opponent's match that I'm going to wrestle in the arena on Friday night. So I would come out for one event in the wrestling show. That's to watch the guy that I'm going to wrestle on Friday night. And I would berate him, obviously, and, and uh, you know, make insulting remarks about him. And, and uh, they would mic me up. I'd have them mic me up occasionally so that they could hear what I'm saying. Uh, and that was a nice little twist, too. So uh, my every, every week, I'm sitting there watching my opponent. I'm going to wrestle on Friday. I had my secretary taking notes about the wrestling style and the ability of this guy that's in the ring. Uh, and I didn't just berate the guy I'm going to wrestle. I berated my secretary uh, big time. I mean, I really treated her badly during these TV matches and even worse during the interviews. Uh, my total disrespect uh, for women went a long way, I think, toward making me a great heel very quickly. Uh, people just really, really despise me for the way I treated this, this woman. Two quick questions for you, Ron. One, how did your wife enjoy, if she did, playing the role of your secretary? And two, how do you get over if you don't work on TV? Well, that's two great questions. She didn't. She um, she didn't know I was going to be as 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 bad as I as end up being, uh, and I didn't either. You know, I the fur the further once I got started into the berating of her, I just I, it got worse and worse and worse, and uh, and actually she's not going to stay in that that position very long, and because I almost take it so far that she believes that I'm <laughs> I'm a heel, and, and this to where she doesn't care much for me or herself, so. You know, it's it's kind of a bad situation. It gets very real. 
and so, and that's a great question about how do I get over as a heel when I'm not going to wrestle on TV? And, and that goes back to my experience in Florida. And they were shooting these matches from Tampa and other cities. And, and they were coming back and showing them on the wrestling program. So I, I really got, God, I, I wanted that to happen for my wrestling program as quickly as possible. So I utilized, I found a guy at another television station that shot stuff in 16 millimeter. And I said, I want you to shoot these workouts that I'm going to do. And I want you to shoot me at the football stadium, running the stadium steps with three sets of leg weights on. And I want to shoot me uh, working out in the gym. And I had, so I was getting this, this exposure on every show, but I wasn't actually out there wrestling. And the fact that I wasn't wrestling and bragging about it because you cheap people aren't going to get to see me for free. You're going to have to buy a ticket down there on Friday night to see a great athlete. Uh, that got a lot of heat and, uh, it just really worked well for me. These little segments that we were shooting on 16 millimeter were anywhere from five to eight minutes, uh, about the length of a match or a little more or than an ordinary match. And by the time those segments were over, I was getting over. People could see that I was a wrestler. I would do these things like shoots. I would have three guys come. Uh, we would get into the arena, put the mat on the ring and shoot with nobody else there except the guy upstairs, shoot it from above. And I would shoot with these guys. I would beat one. I would hook him. They would scream. I would turn him loose. Next guy would just jump on me. Wouldn't even get me an opportunity to get up off the mat. And I would just uh, go round and round, hook him. He'd scream. The next one would come. Back to the first one. We would do uh, sometimes a six or eight minute segment in which I was constantly in action. I would beat all the three of them probably four times and beat them with shooting holes where people, a lot of times, wrestling fans there had never even seen those holes. They were like, wow, what has he got right there? You know, it was perfect. Worked out very, very well. Smart idea. I believe your next factor, Ron, would be your fifth factor. What was that? You know, I'd, I'd never worn a cowboy hat as part of my persona. Uh, and I decided, you know, I'm looking for anything that's going to build heat. And uh, so I started going out and looking for these audacious and flamboyant hats that I could wear each week uh, just to make me different. I wanted to be different than everybody else. And nobody would, didn't have a cowboy in the cruise. Uh, so nobody was wearing any kind of hat. So these were sometimes they would look almost like a cowboy hat. But if I could find one that was funky and look like I was uh, working on the street somewhere, you know, uh, I, I didn't mind going that direction, too. I just wanted to get these different reactions and I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing the boat somewhere. Uh, and then uh, along with the hats, I, I added a big fat cigar. I never was a cigar smoker. But I started smoking cigars for television in particular, uh, and I hated it. I never really enjoyed it. But uh, I added that big fat cigar to my persona, and I continuously blew smoke in the faces of everyone that got close enough to me. I blew this heavy cigar smoke in the face of the commentator, uh, the referees, my opponents. If I could get close enough to the ring to blow it in a guy's face that's in there wrestling somebody, uh, even my secretary, I would sometimes blow it in her face on purpose. Uh, so it was helping me to get this feeling of being a heel. And, uh, and I was starting to love it. I mean, I didn't know whether I was going to like being a heel or not, but I was beginning to really like what was happening. Uh, and I was on my way to becoming a first-class heel. Uh, but there was still just one more thing missing. And uh, I'm just going to go right on into that, my man. Uh, the final factor in my developing into a heel. I, I needed, I thought to myself, you need a name. You know, Dusty Road was the American dream. And, uh, you know, oh, you know, uh, the steamboat was uh, Ricky the Dragon. I mean, you know, everybody that's going to be a star, uh, Lawler is the king. I mean, you know, and I, I, I felt like you know, I need something. There's some, I need a moniker. I need a name that, uh, that I'm known by. And, uh, so, 
I wanted to get myself a name that would just instantly evoke some hatred. Every time I called myself that name, I wanted the fans to just want to, you know, get their knives out, you know. I, and I spent a lot of time on the road and at home trying to come up with with this name, whatever whatever it's going to be. It has to be perfect. I needed something that was true, uh, something w- with actual facts about me that kind of uh, – that kind of told a story about, yeah, he could be that name, whatever it is. Uh, and, and, uh, I had to, I had to make it fit what was, be, what I was becoming in the ring and, and fit with my interviews. It had to be short and it had to be very descriptive. And, you know, and I started to list the things out, uh, that my new heel name would need to, to, to describe me. You know, everything about it need to be based upon being a heel and bragging about it. Uh, things like the fact I was born in Tennessee from a wrestling bloodline. I was very big and strong. These are all heel thoughts. I mean, stuff that you would say. I had more nerve and determination than anybody else. I was a winner and didn't lose. I was good looking. I stood out in the crowd. I was better than the rest of these guys. All these things and thoughts that would create great heat by just speaking the words of give myself a name. Uh, and it was very difficult to, exa- to find out exactly uh, what I was looking for. And then one night, um, within about three weeks of arriving in Tennessee, I'm on my way home from wrestling in, in some city, Chattanooga, probably, because I was going down there some on Saturday nights and wrestling for uh, Roy and, and Nick in Chattanooga. Uh, I might have been coming back from Chattanooga and listening to the radio. And I wasn't even thinking about my wrestling name on this trip or searching for it. I hadn't even thought about it that whole day. And uh, I'm listening to the radio, and the DJ introduced a song uh, by my grandfather's favorite singer, a guy named Eddie Arnold. And I, I hadn't heard that song since, since uh, I was riding the roads with Roy way back in the late 1950s, and I barely remembered it. But I listened to it just briefly, and it was exactly what I had been looking for. It was, it was like my quest for the perfect name ended even before the song finished, you know, I felt like the the guy had written that song for me, and uh, so I wanted to I wanted to play the song here today, you know, and uh, and I find out, you know, that's probably not a good idea because you know you have to have permission to play play this music on podcast or whatever. So, so for those of you that have never heard it. And would like to, uh, you can hear this song online. You, you can Google uh, and just Google the song Tennessee Stud, Tennessee Stud song. And, uh, and uh, try to listen to the Eddie Arnold version because it's really the best one in my opinion. And uh, so and, uh, I'm going to read a verse from the song. Since I can't play the song, I'm going to read a verse that was very fitting for for what's about to happen and why I really like the name of this song. Uh, my plug, the guy that wrote the song was a guy named uh, Jimmy Driftwood. And he wrote this song in 1959. Uh, but the verse in the song says the Tennessee stud, they're speaking of a horse. Obviously the Tennessee stud was long and lean, the color of the sun and his eyes were green. He had the nerve and he had the blood. There was never a horse like the Tennessee stud. Well, the next Saturday when I went to TV, I could hardly wait for my interview to the, and you know, to the best of my memory, I want to try to duplicate some of the things I said, I'm sure in this interview, when I wanted to introduce my new name and it probably started off like, uh, something like this, uh, you know, it's your pleasure, Mr. Commentator. And then that would have been Jim Hess, uh, and, uh, and all these freeloading hillbillies out here in the studio, and I'd be pointing out that direction when I said it, to have somebody as pretty and talented as me on the show again today. Uh, it's a special day, not just for me, but for all Tennesseans. And I'd again point at him and point at the audience, and 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 not just for all the Tennesseans, but for all the losers like you and those people sitting here in the studio. Uh, something big is about to happen right here today. 
I have one of the best winning records in history over my first four years as a brilliant wrestler. I was born in the state of Tennessee, and I'm the biggest and the best of an extraordinary bloodline of fantastic wrestlers. Uh, I'm the best wrestler ever to come out of this state or any other state in America or the world. I'm big, strong, fast, good-looking, dangerous to other wrestlers, respected and admired by all fans, and fast becoming the most popular wrestler in the state, especially right here in Knoxville. I know how much you fans love me already, but today I have a special announcement, and this is a day none of you will ever forget. All my illustrious career, I have been known as Ron Fuller, but today I'm changing my name forever. From this day forward, when you, my adoring fans, speak to me or to anyone you know, when you brag about me, I give you permission now to call me by my new name. And my new name is The Tennessee Stud. Because just like the song, I think I went on and said, just like that song says, I've got the nerve and I've got the blood. There's never been a man like the Tennessee stud. And uh, with a big old huge smile on my face and a big puff on my cigar and I blew smoke in Jim Hess's face who's standing there, I leave the studio to a sound of booze like I'd never heard before in my life. Uh, with my new identity and all those boos still ringing in my ears, I was sure right then that my heel career was about ready to take off. Well, Ron, that seems like a good place to stop it for this week, the development of the Tennessee Stud, and we will pick up the story next week. But, of course, we want to remind you, you can follow the Tennessee Stud on Facebook, the page, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. All you have to do is like that page, and boom, you are instantly friends with the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller. You can also follow him on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last, and you can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts, classic wrestling talk, and wrestling humor, the 605 Super Podcast. Once again, we want to remind everyone, part one of Super Studcast number 14 with the dangerous Dr. D. David Schultz has been a huge success. Part two will be released Tuesday, February 26th, which will be covering your questions on the Knoxville Wrestling War of 1979. Due to the tremendous response that Super Studcast 13 on the Knoxville Wrestling War has received, this will be a special question and answer session for all patrons all about the Knoxville Wrestling War. Don't miss this. There will be much discussion of Ron's feelings about the recent bombshell release on the internet of the Knoxville Five's Plan B to expose wrestling to the world. These historic Super Stud Cast number 13 and 14, as well as all the other ones, are rocking the wrestling world, and we want to invite you to check them out at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast, only $2.99. For over three hours of classic wrestling audio a month, the best deal in wrestling, the Super Studcast. Ron, I mentioned next week's show. Where are we going next week? Well, I, I we've got a lot of ground to cover, man. I'm really enjoying just sitting and looking at the, the things that we're going to be talking about in the, in the near future. From here on out, basically, as long as I do Studcast, I think they're all going to be very, very interesting, hopefully for fans. We're going to talk next week about the, about the first few cards uh, that I book when I start running the company. Uh, we're going to talk about the talent that I'm adding from outside the state of Tennessee. I'm starting to get my own wrestlers. I need to. We're going to discuss, discuss territories booking arrangements with local promoters. Uh, the one that we talked a little bit about this program and how much money you had to pay them to send you these guys and what happens if they don't get you the guys that they're supposed to. And uh, we're going to talk to the buildup of the first Ron Wright and Ron Fuller feud that uh, is going to be weeks down the road but uh, we're going to start into how I start building for Ron Wright and my um, first match together. And I uh, think uh, fans will find that to be extremely interesting. We do a lot of things that's probably not been done. Ron Fuller's Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller, 
I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.